from MTN, the Montana Television Network. This is Face the State. Good morning. Thanks for joining Mike and I on Face the State today. On the ballot this November are several statewide offices that are very important to the everyday lives of Montanans, but are often lost in all the attention drawn to the governors and house races. To help you make informed choices this fall, we invited candidates for the Secretary of State, Auditor, OPI, and the Supreme Court to join us on Face the State for many debates. Today is our first debate. We are joined today by Jesse Lasovich, the Democratic Party nominee for State Auditor. We invited Republican Matt Rosendale to join us. Unfortunately, he declined. Jesse, thanks for tracking to Bozeman to chat with us today. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it very much. So why exactly are you running for state audit? It's uh, simple for me and in, in many ways kind of corny, but I love the work. Uh, I've been in the office now for uh, seven years as an, an underutilized office. It's an underestimated office. It's an unknown office. If you had told me seven years ago that I'd be running for the office, I would have called you a liar um, when, I, when I first started. But you being there and you see the impact on people, not only investors in Montana, but those who have insur health insurance or uh, don't have insurance, whether it's any kinds of insurance, property uh, uh, and casualty, uh, insurance, workers' compensation, all those things all go through our office. And so uh, people's claims are denied, we help. People who are scammed, uh, we help. Um, and so I want to continue that work, really. I really, really enjoy it. It's important work. Uh, one thing I'd like to ask you is, why are you a Democrat? This is the partisan office. Yeah. So why are you a Democrat, aside from the fact that you're from Anaconda? Yeah. <laughs> so definitely the upbringing in Anaconda has an impact uh, on that. Um, it's, it's not a, a political office, as you say. You, uh, you have to identify yourself. Uh, but ultimately, for me, uh, I've identified myself with the Democratic Party on the social uh, issues uh, in a general sense. Uh, and I'm probably more moderate on the on the fiscal issues and when I was in the legislature for uh, 10 years um, uh, my I think my record reflects uh, both of those in a general sense the other thing I'll just sit, tell you when I was in high school uh, I studied and loved John F Kennedy and, um, and so when I first ran in addition to being from Anaconda and you don't run for office in Anaconda unless you're a Democrat uh, <laughs> President Kennedy had a, a big influence on me even though uh, he, of course, uh, was gone, and so I was pleased once I got in the legislature that my beliefs were generally consistent with the Democratic Party. So you talk a lot about your experience and why that is an important coming into this particular office. Why don't you tell us a little bit about the experience that you think is relevant for this particular position and how it's going to shape your approach um, should you actually win in November? Yeah, so this office, I think in many ways, unlike the other statewide offices, um, is uh, an office that uh, requires somebody to have a degree of knowledge in two industries that are extraordinarily complicated. Um, and so when I came into the office, the only background I had, I did a little bit of private practice work for a firm in Missoula, uh, was exposed to insurance work uh, briefly, took insurance law in law school, but that was the end of it. And so getting into the office and seeing just exactly what it does, whether it's forms, so the policies that insurance companies want to uh, uh, sell in Montana are reviewed and ultimately have to be approved by us. Uh, all of our insurance agents in Montana licensed through our office uh, and we review those applications to uh, make sure that uh, they're uh, acceptable to uh, sell insurance and if there is a criminal history then we won't of course or look at it more closely and, and perhaps not grant the license. We want to make sure insurance companies are solvent. There's a very important actuarial bureau in the, in the office where you're reviewing the rates that insur insurance companies are seeking to impose. And so having that understanding of the office, the, the good, what needs to be improved in the office, I think is uh, important. Knowing the limits of the office is important so I don't stand up as a candidate and make promises that I can't keep, uh, I think is really important. Um, and then actually being in the trenches, ultimately, David, uh, for, the, for the last seven years, uh, I think when issues come up, uh, if I'm the auditor over at least the next four years, uh, uh, I'll have an under a clear understanding of them and, and someone won't be able to pull the wool over my eyes um, on whatever the issues are. 
Yeah, you, you kind of answered my question already, one I'm going to ask, but of course you're running against Mr. Rosendale. Uh, I'm wondering what about your experience makes you the better choice than Mr. Rosendale to run this office? Yeah, well, I, for me it's, it's about the, the knowledge uh, of the office, the uh, securities and insurance uh, industry experience, uh, the work that I've done um, not only on a day-to-day -day basis, but the work with the legislature since I've been in the office starting in uh, 2010. We both have uh, legislative experience, so uh, he can't say that he has more uh, legislative experience uh, than me. Um, I think the other big difference between the two of us relative to experience is the willingness to work with uh, the, the other side of the aisle. Um, and you can't do that and, and you can't have an agenda, what, regardless of the, the state office you're in, without re legislative support, whether it's Democrat or Republican. And uh, so that kind of experience, that bipartisan experience uh, that I've had in the legislature that I've demonstrated working in the audit auditor's office and I think that has benefited me as I've run for this office with organizations on both sides supporting my candidacy bodes well for for me if I'm elected. Ten years in the legislature you were elected as a as a youngin and with more you, hair too. So, so, <laughs> so give me give me an example of that bipartisan spirit that you yeah brought into the legislature and, and give me some concrete examples. Appreciate of what that. You did. So in, uh, in 2009 or well 2009, I think it was uh, uh, Alan Olson, who's a Republican representative from Roundup uh, at the time, carried House Bill 25 and it dealt with, um, we utility heard about regulation. deregulation, but utility regulation. Uh, it was uh, controversial. Uh, the governor at the time, Governor Schweitzer, uh, wasn't enamored with it. Um, and and I, had, I signed on to it. I was in the Senate uh, and I had members in my party, the Great Falls delegation. I had members uh, in the Missoula delegation in my party who were opposed uh, to that. And uh, Alan got it through the House and it came onto the Senate. It's one a proud accomplishment for me. Um, uh, it died on a tie vote when I first made the motion and then got uh, a few folks to change their vote on the next motion when they tried to kill the bill and it ultimately passed. Without that legislation, you wouldn't have the Mill Creek Generating Station outside of my uh, uh, hometown of Anaconda. You wouldn't have had Northwestern Energy purchasing the hydroelectric uh, electric dams. So you look back at that experience and a lot of these bills that are enacted, you, you can't see the tangible benefit. That not only can you see the tangible benefit to the legislation, but you can see the, the benefit of working together. And for the benefit of our viewers, this is the bill that essentially re-regulated Northwestern Energy after the deregulation of the late 1990s. That's right. Now, the other thing, I, you know, Mike and I spent a little bit of time kind of going through your legislative record a little bit, and, and I saw a lot of uh, bills that you sponsored on mental health. Yeah. So what are, first of all, why, why is that issue important to you, and what do you think the challenges are on that issue that you might be able to address as a state auditor? Yeah, so, uh, well, I'll start with the, the latter part of your question first. So one thing that we have in health insurance uh, that has become a problem is mental health parity in their efforts and that means that, that we're treating mental illnesses similarly to our physical illnesses. So you, you, uh, you having that same kind of, of access if you have a mental illness versus uh, a physical illness and under the Affordable Care Act, they've made strides on that. But at the state level, uh, uh, we wanna uh, pursue uh, that aggressively to achieve parity both uh, uh, for uh, mental illnesses and physical illnesses. As uh, for my legislative experience, I represented the Montana State Hospital uh, and, and, the, and many of the people who worked there and it's always overcrowded uh, and, there, and, and you have people coming from all over the state who are in the criminal justice system who have nowhere else to go uh, and they're, they're chronically underfunded at least when I was in the, in the legislature. So the goal on the mental illness work when I was in the legislature was to try to get the people who really needed to be at the Montana State Hospital because of uh, possible um, uh, security concerns but the people who really didn't need to be there to have the kind of community resources set up in the communities throughout the state where they could uh, uh, be still be a part of the communities without without having to go to the state hospital now you mentioned the Affordable Care Act uh, which is going to be a big part of right. your job and a big part of this campaign uh, you know that um, opponents of it are going to say that um, it's a bad idea it's a right. bad law right. do you support it and is it doing 
what you think it should be doing? Is it accomplishing what it, what it should be accomplishing? So I think uh, when when it comes to the accomplishments, I th the, it certainly has accomplished getting more people insured. No one can argue that with the uh, with uh, the the drop that we've seen in Montana uh, from approximately I think fifteen percent to I uh, know in single digits may, maybe seven six or percent. seven percent. Mm -hmm. uh, so and I think that's directly correlated. Um, the problem with uh, the Affordable Care Act, from my perspective and being in the office, is it's so insurance has been health insurance particularly is traditionally and legally. Uh, a state-based activity regulated by by uh, the states under the McCarran-Ferguson Act. What's happening with the Affordable Care Act with CMS Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, they're um, uh, becoming essentially like an insurance commissioner. So insurance companies doing business in this state and ultimately consumers if they have problems, uh, they can come to us, but if, ult if it's a federal issue then we refer them to CMS which becomes problematic. The other part with the industry is uh, you, you have the, the uh, possible conflict bef between state law and and federal law so and we can't do anything about that that is what it is but I do think that we have a moral obligation as a society to provide access to coverage for people who are sick and and prior to the Affordable Care Act um, you had people who had chronic or terminal conditions who were being unwritten by insurance companies who, who couldn't get the, the coverage and therefore weren't getting access to treatment. I think morally uh, that's wrong and so that's, that's part of the Affordable Care Act uh, that I support. But the other part of that, Mike, is that they, that comes with cost. So you, you've seen the uh, substantial rate increases that the insurance companies are seeking to uh, impose uh, for the, for the individual market. Yeah, in the individual market and the small group market mm -hmm. uh, in uh, 2017. Um, and, and clearly, because of the utilize, utilization, you have these people who are, who are sick or using the system, there's a higher cost to that, which ultimately means higher premiums. And the second part of that that I've been talking about is the ultimate cost itself. If you looked, and I, I know you guys both, uh, I, I presume you followed it, uh, but it's increased costs in pharmacy, it's increased costs in utilization, so people asking or, or uh, accessing the system, and it's actually the costs themselves to, to uh, go to the, the hospital. That's what I think we need to focus on. I can stand uh, uh, in front of you and, and everybody uh, who's watching and say, I'm gonna lower health insurance premiums. That would be pandering, um, uh, particularly uh, uh, since the, the premiums are filed with our office um, that you, we can't approve or disapprove, but you can try to have an impact. I want to focus on the underlying problem, and I think that's cost. And so what can we do about uh, addressing those costs so we can bring some stability to our health insurance premiums? So what can we do addressing those costs, it's particularly in the role of the auditor? You smartly yep. know you can't really affect those premiums. That's right. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'm glad you asked it. So what I've been talking about is more transparency uh, in, in our uh, costs and working with our, the Montana Hospital Association and uh, employer groups and uh, uh, some consumers to bring more transparency to uh, a non-emergency situation for our major hospitals, so our PPS hospitals, not our critical access hospitals. I wouldn't include uh, those, but I would include the hospitals in our bigger uh, cities in, in uh, Montana for the top 50 to 100 most popular procedures where uh, you know as, as a, p a prospective patient. So I want to get that, a stent in or what, something. Yeah, like that, yeah, or a knee surgery or yeah. hip surgery. I know what the cost is prior to going into it. And right now that is very difficult to do. You call the hospital if you've both done it. I've done it. It's really hard. You can oh, wait yeah, days and weeks. Difficult. And, um, and it shouldn't be that when we get our explanation of benefits from the insurance company, here's what the cost was. So it does two things, I think, or will do two things. One, it'll incentivize consumers to vote with their feet, right? So if they're, in, or their tires, I guess, uh, willing to drive from Bozeman, for example, to uh, Billings or, or vice versa. The second thing, though, and it goes to the, the, the point that I was making about trying to get a handle on costs, and is this going to be the ultimate solution? No, but I think it's a part of the puzzle, uh, and, and that is that once, the hosp once the hosp we have more transparency in the market and you have hospitals that are, uh, are seeing what other big hospitals, similar hospitals are charging for various procedures, that we can put some downward pressure on, on some of the, the procedures uh, 
uh, the, uh, for which they're, they're charging. And I think that will ultimately put uh, some downward pressure on some of these premium increases. Now, is that something that's going to require a law that for the, leg the legislature to pass to, to create this transparency, to create prices that we can see? That's right. Okay. It, it required the legislature to approve it. I've already talked to some Republican legislators, to my point. There's a Republican legislator who's willing to carry it. Uh, I've talk, we, we, employers, as I said, are, are on board. Uh, and the Montana Hospital Association, Association has to be at the table to do it. And to your point, David, about the auditor's office, the auditor's office has to be at the table, too, to coordinate, uh, I think, everything and bring everything uh, together, particularly uh, because of the uh, health insurance uh, role that the auditor's uh, office plays. And then, of course, you don't want to forget about the health insurance companies either. We all need to make this work. It's, uh, the, the trend we're on is unsustainable. Now, other states, they do have the, the statutory authority, auditors gen to set those premium rates. Would you advocate getting that ability? Would you advocate a law to the legislature saying, I should have this authority? Yeah, that's a really good question. Other states do. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm, it's still up in the air, and here's why for me. Um, uh, the, in, in New Mexico, for example, they have the, the authority. The New Mexico Insurance Commissioner disapproved last year HCSE, and they're the parent company for Blue Cross Blue Shield here in Montana, their proposed rate increases, and they pulled out of the market. Um, and, and so I, I, I don't want to create that here in Montana where we have insurance companies who are pulling out of the market because of decisions that uh, our office uh, is making, but the other part, part of it too is in terms of the accountability. So even without the uh, approval or disapproval authority in, in our office, and, and this year I think will be different, but in previous years when we've said that we don't think this is actuarially supported, they've lowered their, their proposed rate increases. Um, and, uh, and so uh, it worked that we, that the fact that we were just reviewing um, it, it, the jury's still out for me as to whether we should have approval or disapproval th uh, um, authority. We'll see how this year, uh, this year goes with uh, where we stand and where the insurers stand with their proposed rate increases. Now, your opponent has pointed out or said that uh, your office, the auditor, eliminated the Insure Montana program, which of course is a popular program right. that subsidized in health insurance for a small business. I mean, that's that's accurate, is it not? And tell us uh, why that happened and why that was the way to go and whether the criticism of that is, is, is legitimate. Yeah, so it's actually false. Um, and, and he knows that it's uh, false, which is why it's so troubling. So we proposed in, uh, the, at the beginning of the last legislative session to make changes to the Insure Montana program because the shop wasn't working in the federal exchange and we wanted to try to get a waiver from the federal government so that we could continue the Insure Montana mar uh, program here in Montana. The Republicans, in the legislature, the, the folks we were working with had concerns about that. And so what we did, we, based on those concerns, we revised the legislation um, to uh, get, to make it more, uh, to, to not get the waiver, get out, they were concerned about any attachment to the Affordable Care Act. So we got rid of all that stuff and got it through the legislature. And then the governor vetoed it. And, and that was despite our uh, asking him uh, to sign it. Uh, and so your law. proposal was to uh, sustain in Sure Montana through the biennium or just it was, a year? It was through the biennium. Okay. Give us another two years, see what happens in the marketplace. We're going to need some general fund money um, uh, for that, uh, but we can make this work in the, in the, in the legislature agreed on a bipartisan vote. Um, and unfortunately what happened, uh, it was toward the end of the session, the governor vetoed it. And I, th I, th I thought we had a good chance of overriding the veto. But because of the timing of when he delivered uh, the veto to the legislature, they didn't get a chance to, uh, because of a procedural mechanism, didn't get a chance to vote on it. Otherwise, I think we would have gotten that done. Um, and, and so that's what's disappointing about his, his uh, rhetoric about it. It's just flat false. So I, I spent some time looking at your campaign donations that you've received and, and kind of added it up using follow the money. And you've got something like thirty to forty thousand dollars in money from uh, donations from lobbyists, the insurance industry, the real estate industry, the finance industry, all these industries that you're going to be regulating. Sure. So specifically, how can you be an advocate for Montanans when Blue Cross Blue Shield is giving you campaign donations right. when they're one of the largest insurers in the state? Right. So the uh, nature of our campaign finance system is such that you need to raise money to get your message out. And what I've said to people, and I've uh, been raising money 
is that I'm not going to be picky about where it comes from. Uh, and if you think that uh, a $330 donation or a $990 donation now is going to make an impact on my judgment, then you're going to be mistaken. Um, and, and to your point, David, collectively, maybe it, your, your question is, will it have an impact? Um, I, I have been actively involved in issues in the office that have been adverse to Blue Cross Blue Shield of Montana. The prime example is when we fined them $500,000 and made them donate $500,000 to the mental health uh, um, efforts that were happening here at MSU uh, Bozeman. Um, uh, to tr go back to your, your first question or one of your first questions about uh, mental illnesses, that was a grueling and uh, difficult process. Similarly, when HCSC acquired Blue Cross, that was a grueling and difficult process. And I think if you talk to people who uh, know me and have worked with me, they'll know that I'll be reasonable um, and uh, approachable, uh, and then the, but the, the, the donations and, and uh, the support doesn't have anything to do ultimately with the decision I'll make. The law, by, by law, uh, the office is a consumer protection office. We've got to um, put them first, and, and that's what I'll continue to do as auditor. I mean, at the end of the day, though, we're captive to these big insurers. So why not do one of two things? Either one, move to a single-payer system and get rid of those insurance companies to begin with, or the other system Republicans propose is that we open up competition beyond state lines, which would reduce your authority. Are either one of those palatable options? You know, I think if you talk to people, um, because of what has happened in the marketplace, uh, the, um, the, the path that we're on, there, there's, there's going to have to be a candid discussion about single payer because it just is a broken system. Um, and, 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 and so I clearly, if I'm the auditor, want to be a part of that conversation. I don't think it's going to happen in the, in the short term. But in the short term, and we'll continue to hear the rhetoric, rhetoric and we heard it from uh, the Republican uh, presidential nominee um, the, about the state lines. The problem with that argument is in Montana right now, so we have three main health insurers, um, and we have others who are doing business here too. We have licensed over 200 health insurers in Montana who can be doing the business, but have decided not to do the business. So the opening up the state lines argument is, well, there'll be more competition. Um, those folks who are on the other, other sides of Montana's lines are licensed to do business here and are not offering um, uh, policies here for, uh, uh, I'm sure, a variety of reasons. So it's a, it makes for a good talking point, but, but uh, the reality is um, it, it won't do anything. Now, we haven't talked too much about the financial regulation that goes on in your office, regulating the financial industry. Uh, are there any changes in the way the office does business that you have in mind, if you're the auditor, to regulate that industry and, and, uh, and watch over it? Yeah, so the big legislative change, it wouldn't be a change, but a request, so it would be a continuation uh, of what we're doing is a Securities Restitution Assistance Fund. And Securities Restitution Assistance Fund, something that uh, um, um, my opponent and I uh, differ on. Uh, this is a fund that is available for victims of securities fraud who um, aren't able to access money from a securities firm. Um, and so when they're not able to access money from a uh, securities fund, they can apply to the Securities Restitution Assistance Fund. We went to the legislature in 2011, got the fund, and then we went back to the legislature because there wasn't enough money and said, hey, can you peel off some of the securities fees it is to bring some stability we, uh, to, the, to the fund. We've paid out over a million dollars to victims of securities fraud across the, the state. That fund is set to sunset at the end of June. Uh, a big part of the work that I love uh, um, ab uh, about the office is this securities uh, fraud uh, work. It's rewarding. It becomes addicting because you're, you can pursue folks who are victimizing people, hold them accountable, and then get some money back uh, for uh, the victims uh, as well. And, and, uh, and so uh, in January of, of 2017, if I'm the auditor, that won't be a foreign concept to me. Not only will uh, I'll be able to oversee it, but I anticipate uh, actively participating in it. Now, if you're elected uh, auditor, you'll also be a member of the, of the state land board, yeah. one of five members that uh, sets policy, makes decisions on state lands. Uh, what is your view of the land board as far as what it should be doing, and how might that differ from your Republican opponent? Well, I think the first big difference uh, with uh, 
uh, my opponent and myself is access, public access, and we, you, everybody's been uh, talking about it, and it's not just a, a talking point for me. I mean, this is a, a, a big fight, um, and, and I, I don't think anyone can argue or will argue that we don't do a good job in Montana managing, managing our state trust lands, but I do resist uh, the efforts to say that those federal lands should come under the state. It's impractical, and it's going to be too costly, and it's not enough for me, as my opponent has said, uh, previously, well, well, I have a lot of property and I let anybody come onto the property. This isn't about asking for permission. This is about public lands that we all own uh, as, as Montanans. So on the land board, those issues that come up will be really important to me that will be different from my opponent. And then also um, just the developmental questions uh, um, uh, I think will be different. Uh, I'm going to approach each one on a, on a case by case uh, basis. Um, and. Um, and not be a rubber stamp for, for either side and, and balance my duties uh, as a fiduciary to the school trust lands account. Most of those decisions on the land board are unanimous, 5-0, 5-0, 5-0. Right. So one has to ask the question, would it really make a difference if it's you or Matt Rosendale on there? One controversial decision, at least there was a vote the other way, was on leasing Otter Creek. Mm -hmm. Denise Chiron voted no. Would, how would you have voted on that particular I decision? Don't, I don't, I, I, um, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I, I, uh, I probably at the time, considering everything in front of me, likely would have been a yes uh, vote. Um, and um, I wasn't involved in, in my boss, the commissioner voted uh, yes. Um, I went out there and, and toured it and liked to see things uh, on the, on, uh, for my own uh, on the ground and, uh, and toured a surface a coal mine in Wyoming to see what it would uh, look like. But those issues that come up, David, um, yeah, you're right. There are a lot of them that are, are not controversial. I think part of that may be because of the makeup of the land board uh, now where you have four Democrats and I think a rel relatively moderate Republican. Um, but if you get some of these folks on the land board who aren't as moderate, um, then you're going to start seeing some big differences. So in the spectrum of Democratic candidates, I mean, the, you know, the Democratic Party of Montana often aligns itself with environmentalists, conservation groups, uh, wh where do you stand on the spectrum in terms of considering yourself an environmentalist or, or however you would define yourself on, on that issue? It's, uh, uh, I consider myself uh, a conservationist, um, and, but also with, uh, but, but that doesn't mean that requests for development I would be, I'd always be a no on. Um, grew up on a Superfund site, right, in Anaconda. <laughs> so clearly I'm not uh, an advocate to do whatever we can do to develop our natural resources and have Superfund sites across the state. So when these issues come up and with two young children, um, there's got to be an eye toward the future um, and, uh, in terms of our, our climate, in terms of the impact on our environment, while at the same time balancing our obligations to the school trust lands account, which I'll do. We're coming towards the end of our show, so we need a quick answer to this question. $84 million budget is the state of ours budget, and you've got about, uh, I think it's something like about 80 plus staff members. Is that sufficient, or do you need more? And we've got about 15 seconds. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think we do a bang up job with the resources we have. Um, as the industry continues to grow and become more complicated, I'm sure there, I'll have discussions with legislators about uh, possible staffing issues, but right now, uh, I, I think preserving what we have and making sure those folks are, are adequately compensated for their extraordinary work uh, will be what I'll be advocating for in next session. Well, thank you, Jesse Lasevich, our Democratic candidate for state auditor. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, stay tuned for our next debate, which will be the Attorney General's debate. See you next time. On You've been watching Face the State, a presentation of MTN, the Montana Television Network.